the most written about woman in the whole Bible. What is your impression of Mary? There are thousands upon thousands of images of her. The beautific and holy Madonna, mother and child, otherworldly in her serenity, and the grieving mother holding her crucified son. Again, beautific, serene, otherworldly. I mean, we might get the impression that as a young girl being visited by Archangel Gabriel, she was soft and submissive and gentle and meek. And certainly, those have been the traditional feminine qualities for, well, millennia. And she surely had these qualities. But is it possible we've missed the real person underneath the patina of 2,000 years worth of iconography? When we first meet Mary in Luke's Gospel, she seems to take a visit with one of the mightiest beings in the universe almost in stride. Daniel was trembling and speechless when he first saw an angel. Actually, I think he fell to the ground. So the angel said, fear not, I come in response to your prayer. And when Joseph saw an angel, the first words the angel said were, fear not. What did the angel say to the trembling and speechless Zechariah? Fear not. But to Mary, the first words angel Gabriel said were greetings, favored one. Already, that tells us a lot about Mary's courage and sense of presence. And there was more. To Gabriel, Mary was favored by God in heaven and blessed among all the women of earth. She was not afraid of Gabriel, as so many people before her had been. But she was perplexed and started pondering what the angel must have in mind. And it was then that Gabriel told her not to fear because he had come bringing good news. And after the good news was delivered, that she would bring forth the Son of the Most High God, the promised Messiah, conceived by the Holy Spirit, Mary squared her young shoulders, and she said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Now she surely understood the implications of being an unwed mother in a culture where that might even bring death by stoning. She knew the risk of losing her betrothal, what it might mean to be as a widow without husband or family homestead. But she also had towering faith in the power, provision, and promise of Almighty God. There are not that many people in the Bible who said those words to God after receiving a commission. And the one who most famously said it was Isaiah in the sanctuary of the temple before a vision of the Lord who filled the temple with God's glory. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Now I actually think that it's not by accident that Mary said those words. It seems this girl was well versed in the scriptures, as her song of praise reveals. After rejoicing in the blessing holy God had rested upon her, Mary alluded to a good number of foundational scriptural passages on the nature of God, God's character and values. Consider these inferences with her Magnificat in Luke 1. Verse 49, the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. God's instruction to the people, you shall not profane my holy name that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord, I sanctify you. Verse 50. His mercy is for those who fear him generation to generation. The Lord's revelation of God to Moses. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm, has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. Isaiah 2 The haughty eyes of people shall be brought low, and the pride of everyone shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up and high. 
verse 52 to 53. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones, lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. From Proverbs. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. Verses 54 to 55. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Genesis 12. God's promise to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of earth shall be blessed. Just imagine the young Mary rocking her son and singing the Magnificat to him as his cradle song. Jesus was raised up in a home which loved and honored God, with parents who took seriously God's command to teach their children all of God's words, even to talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Mary had depths of strength, as young as she was, in her faith in God and in her understanding of the scriptures and in her commitment to God's call. And it is to her honor that we can see her teaching reflected years later in Jesus' own teaching through the Beatitudes. So about a month and a half after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph made the short trip from Bethlehem to Jerusalem because Mary needed to make her new mother offering after the time of her confinement had ended. And after the excitement about being visited by an angel and of staying with Elizabeth and Zechariah for three months and seeing the birth of John the Baptist, and then after the celebration of the shepherds and angels, it must have shaken her to hear Simeon's prophecy of a sword piercing her soul because of this little baby son. We know Mary was a deep-thinking person, for twice he recorded that Mary treasured in her heart what the angels had announced about Jesus and what later Jesus had said about himself at the age of 12. She would have known the proverb that teaches us we should train up a child in the way they should go, and Mary did, parenting between the delicate balance of giving a child security and freedom. And in the story of Jesus at 12, Mary and Joseph were both taken aback when they discovered, halfway back to Nazareth from Jerusalem, that their normally very responsible and reliable son had turned up missing. And after three frantic days of searching everywhere, it must have been God who directed their steps to the inner offices of the temple complex, where they did indeed find their precocious and serious child holding forth with the best of Israel's theologians and scribes, but instead of being intimidated by such an array of the temple elite, or even proud that their son had held the attention of Israel's finest scholars for days on end, the first words out of Mary's mouth were, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. I want you to note, it was Mary who spoke in that room full of men, not Joseph. And I think we learn from Mary in these early stories is that great faith requires both boldness and resiliency, because in that experience, Mary learned her son, the son of the Most High God, was coming into his own. And even though Jesus would be obedient to her clear through to the beginning of his ministry nearly 20 years later, Mary also knew Jesus was now entering into his destiny. It was time for her to step back and trust his lead. Now the next story with Mary comes through John, and it was soon after Jesus had begun gathering his disciples, and he took the first six disciples with him to a wedding in Cana, where it seems Mary was part of the inner circle, part of the family circle there. Now every wedding symbolized God's marriage to Israel, and the wine represented the prosperity and joy of God's blessing. It would have been a disaster if the wine ran out before the wedding feast was over. And it was at this point, at the high point of the festivities, that Mary came to Jesus to tell him the wine was gone. Now, 
Mary was close to the family. She was familiar with the servants. Apparently, she was part of the behind-the-scenes activities, so she was able to see this potentially devastating situation before it happened, and she wanted to rescue the situation before the family was humiliated and the celebration was spoiled. But Mary was evidently not in a position to buy wine or get more wine, so she went to her son, who had always proven so capable and faithful in taking care of her and taking care of his family. Now, Mary did not tell Jesus to do anything. She simply came to her eldest son with this impossible problem. Of everyone there, she knew best who Jesus really was and had been pondering in her heart for years what that meant. Now, with Jesus' newly gathered disciples at a symbolically rich event, it's possible she saw this as the very opportunity for Jesus to come into his own. Jesus' response to Mary reflects a turning point in their relationship that she may not have been expecting. He was preparing her to see her son as her Lord. Jesus was also deeply aware that timing was essential, so his words may sound cryptic to us who know the story. Because he said, What is this to me? And to you, woman, my hour has not yet come. Now, the word woman here might have taken us aback. In Greek, it's gine, which means woman, or it can mean wife. And I imagine if, if this had been translated in an older version of English, we might actually have seen mistress, which is condensed to Mrs. today. We should really read this word as one of warm respect, as Jesus was talking with Mary in front of the servants and at least some of his disciples. My guess is, actually, considering the detail in this story, John was close to Jesus and he was witnessing the whole thing. So Jesus' question was genuine. I think Jesus was perceiving and discerning Mary's heart. She was not asking Jesus to go grab his friends and quickly run down to the village vintner and buy some more wine. Jesus knew her unspoken request was that he should do something powerful and symbolic, something spiritually significant. And Jesus' hour would come when he would lift a cup of wine and then invite all to drink. But that hour was not this hour. And I think in that moment a deep understanding passed between mother and son. I think Mary humbled her inner desire to see her son exalted as the one she knew he was, and at the same time quietly settled her faith on Jesus, knowing his character and knowing his compassion. So she turned and she told the servants to do whatever Jesus told them to do. And she said this with such firm authority, they accepted her direction unquestioningly. And a picture of Mary is emerging, even in these first three stories, as someone others listened to, whose authority was accepted, who was respected and well-connected within her community. It was not long after that, when Jesus had selected all 12 of his disciples and he had fully launched his public ministry. But now, Mary and her other grown sons had become alarmed and concerned for Jesus' welfare. It was a crisis of faith. And both the Gospels of Mark and Matthew tell that story. From Mark, so he appointed the twelve, then he went home, and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he's gone out of his mind. And from Matthew, while Jesus was still speaking to the crowds, his mother and his brothers were standing outside, wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers, they're standing outside, wanting to speak to you. Now, from Mary's perspective, Jesus' career had skyrocketed from the short time between when he had started gathering his disciples and performed his first sign at the wedding in Cana to this moment when he was so swarmed by people there was no time for him to eat or even sleep. Mary didn't know it yet, but soon Jesus and his disciples were going to push that envelope even harder because they were going to be sleeping outside in the rough and they were going to be gathering grain while it still stood in the fields because they were so hungry. And even today... Think of the things people say to those who work 16-hour days and more, and those who never stop. Workaholic, machines, driven. What about the Sabbath? What about me time? Mary's concern was certainly not misplaced, and neither is ours today. But here was the necessary balance again 
between concern and trust. Jesus was her son, but he was also the son of the Most High God, and his destiny that she had been pondering and treasuring and surely praying about was now begun. Jesus again set the boundary, and this time, by not meeting his mother or his brothers at the door, and thereby giving them an opportunity to try and grab him, but by publicly realigning family connection. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And through this we learn that great faith produces wisdom and humility. Because you see, this was a crisis for Mary. And in this crisis, it seems Mary's unswerving faith found new balance. She understood and even embraced Jesus' teaching. Because we find out that she soon became a part of the women who were following and supporting Jesus. Throughout the Gospels, Mary is often mentioned among their number, but sometimes she's referred to simply as Mary, for she was preeminent among the other Marys. Whether Joseph was still living or had died somewhere along the way, Jesus was now known as the builder's son, whose mother was Mary. Jesus' brothers, who would later all become believers, soon became recognizable names among those who followed Jesus' career. All this points to Mary's continuing strength of faith, the respect and honor she commanded, her authority and connection within her community and within the growing community of believers. Now, many people loved Jesus, and some, like Peter, swore they would be by Jesus' side to the bitter end. But when we finally come to the cross, there was only one man and one woman standing near enough to talk with Jesus, his mother and his closest friend, Mary, and the young disciple John. Much has been made about Jesus conferring John to Mary as her son, and Jesus conferring Mary to John as his mother. Even though we know John's own mother was alive and well, whatever else the Lord intended, we can at least see that Mary was of great importance to Jesus, who valued her deeply. And we can see the immensity of her courage and strength, braving the line of soldiers pounding nails into flesh and the jeering crowds and the angry religious authorities who were finally getting their revenge and all the blood and the gore and the horror of it all. I can only imagine the reason she finally stood back was because she was pressed back by the Roman guard. Now consider, by this point, Mary was 30 years older. In first century Palestine, the typical lifespan, especially of the working class, was somewhere around the 40s or 50s at the most. By any metric, she would now have been considered an older woman. But she was there with Jesus to the last breath. And even afterwards, watching Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, by special permission of the procurator himself, take down Jesus' body. She and the other women followed them to the tomb and observed everything they did. And she was also among those who at dawn came with spices to complete Jesus' burial. And the last time we see Mary in the scriptures is 10 days after Jesus rose into heaven. When they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Jesus' inner circle of 120 women and men had been with him for the past 40 days, being taught in all the scriptures and how they found their fulfillment in Jesus. Now they would pray for 10 days and then be filled by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Mary is the only person named besides the disciples and the only woman named. She and the other women among them would make history when they came streaming out of that upper room, proclaiming the gospel in every language present, as Joel had prophesied and Peter would then explain. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, 
and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. We learn that great faith is ready to break new ground in the power of the Spirit. Far from the many depictions of Mary as soft and otherworldly, she was a woman of grit and authority, yet she also knew how to discipline herself. She understood humility and resiliency, even as she was strong and courageous. May you and I follow in her footsteps. Let's pray. O oh Lord God, thank you for the richness of Mary's story. And by your spirit, would you enable us to follow in her footsteps. To the praise of your glorious grace, amen.